Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bors Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about Shahin Najafi's Tabu Breaking concert in Tel Aviv, Israel, Breaking Borders and Boundaries. Our insane fatwa is about a mission to Mars by the UAE and how it breaks. Is it, is it Islamic? Fatwas? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Our slice of life is of an all-female orchestra in Afghanistan. It's fantastic. You've got to watch this. And this week, rather than, rather than an interview, we have a clip of a speech by brilliant Johan Harry on multiculturalism. Stay with us. Don't go away. The Iranian protest singer Shahin Najafi recently went to Tel Aviv, Israel to take part in a concert with the well-known singer Aviv Geffen and it's caused a lot of discussion in Iran. From my part, I think, what a great thing he did. Why should people, musicians for example in this situation, be seen to be extensions of the Israeli state and its occupation of Palestine and the uh, territories in the same way that, you know, why should Iranian nationals be seen to be extensions of the Iranian regime when we're criticizing the Trump ban on Iranian nationals? It's a wonderful thing to do and it in fact goes to show our common humanity. And that's the point that actually Shahin Najafi has made. But one of the things is that a part of the uh, dominant anti-Semitic narrative of the Islamists across Middle East and North Africa to some extent and also globally as well, all the fascists and the right being are feeding from this anti-Semitism and actually breaking that barrier. It's such an important thing to do, people who go and, uh, and sort of bring unity between people, irrespective of the government, irrespective of the politics of the states. And, uh, you know, people in Iran are opposing the uh, Islamic regime that it's, is very oppressive. The, the uh, peace movement and uh, movement for change in Israel is exactly the same thing. We never should make people responsible for the history of the countries or the state's activity. I mean, that's such an important thing. And this is anti-Semitism needs to be broken as well. I definitely, mean, that's the definitely. And one of the things, I mean, you know, it was wonderful because uh, Shahin Najafi called uh, Aviv Geffen his brother and the crowd went crazy. And he also said that uh, Aviv Geffen is... A, a, a wonderful singer who happens to have been born in Israel. And I think that is how we need to look at people without all this baggage that comes in ways that try to divide us and to say that we're so different. And also it goes to show how music is so empowering and really is so great at baking boundaries. If musicians can't do it, then who is yeah. going to do that? And them? I think people always do. People unite around music, and music is one of those areas that brings people together. Also, but there, there are pressure between the states, and people always express the solidarity. For example, last year, I remember, or about two years ago, when there were the whole um, possibility of war and military conflict between the Islamic regime and the right-wing uh, um, Israeli government, People of Iran and Israel, they were sending message of solidarity that we have. We, we, there is no reason for to uh, war for, for people of Israel and Iran uh, to go to war. And that unity, I think, is important. We need to break all these walls. We need to bring bring people together. Actually, tr people should travel freely to Israel, to Iran, and cement that unity and show the common humanity and destiny that we have, all of us have together. Yeah, and of course we're talking about music, but art is also very instrumental here. And we want to also talk about Banksy's new hotel in Bethlehem. And it's got the worst views of the world, basically, because it's facing the wall that separates uh, the people of Israel and the people of Palestine. And, uh, you know, it's it's a wonderful statement, uh, both as a criticism of oppression, but also, um, you know... To bring people together and, and actually together. breaking the walls. I mean, there was a comment that uh, you know there's a lot more people want to come and see Banksy and his uh, work 
in uh, West Bank and in and, and in Israel than oh, people so go I for to see Jesus. <laughs> I mean, it's the tourism. Jesus is there. <laughs> yeah. or, you know, the uh, Bethlehem <laughs> and the and it's, so people. That's the the strength of art, music, and that brings people together. And that we need to celebrate this. So. Thank you very much, Shahin Najafi, for yeah. taking this step to this step and we'll support you right to the end. Yeah, definitely. This week we'd like to show you a clip of Johan Hari, the journalist, speaking on the issue of multiculturalism at a conference that we organized many years ago. Now, he makes some brilliant points. Really, I think this is just one of those magnificent polemics on this issue. And we've just taken a short clip of it. But basically what he says is that multiculturalism as a social policy boxes people into really restrictive, narrow um, sort of um, pigeonholes them and doesn't see the human being there. So it doesn't allow people to live the lives that they want because it says, well, you know, welcome to Britain, for example. Here's a little box we can put you in. Yeah, and, and one of the things uh, that Ian Harry says, the brilliant, the sparkling brilliance of uh, uh, Ian Harry, he says that wherever you go, where there is oppression or restriction on people, people naturally respond to that. Now, that's what we've been saying for many, many years. The resistance in the Middle East and North Africa is greatest because that's where the main root, you know, source of oppression and Islamism is. And that's if you want to find resistance, that's where you've got to find it and then you need to be able to support that. And when he talks about criticism of religion, he talks about how Christianity has doesn't any longer have this power to terrorize because it's been so ridiculed and questioned. And that's exactly what needs to be done with Islam. And, you know, I think it's a really important point, the f point when people say, well, why do you need to mock? Why do you need to ridicule? How important that is actually in, you know, in... Combating terrorism combating and terror. the terror and yeah. also and demystifying it and being able to question religion and bring it down to a place where it no longer has this power over people's yeah. lives. And that's actually the most important way of combating religion is ridicule and being able to question it while you laugh, while you, you know, you question the roots of it. But in a, in a quite a human way, and, and ridiculing of religion and stupid ideas is the best thing you could do and most powerful uh, tool we have in our hands. Definitely. Watch this clip. You will be amazed. Stay with us. I think it's a big issue. I won't call it the biggest issue in the world, um, but I think it's a very, very big issue. And I think it, uh, part of the problem is the way we're responding in Europe is we have actually quite a flawed ideological uh, framework, which is multiculturalism. And when you criticize multiculturalism, it's very important that you preface it when someone like me criticizes it, it's very important to preface it by saying, this is usually lumped in with immigration. You'll hear the right saying, multiculturalism and immigration have caused X, Y, or Z problem. I passionately believe in, oh, well, I wouldn't exist if it were not for immigration. I passionately believe in immigration. I think we need more immigrants and more refugees in this country, not fewer. But I believe it is a disastrous way to welcome them, to say, hello, Muslim, you have arrived. Here is a Muslim box for us to put you in, where you will be a Muslim forevermore, and you will behave in a way that, that our appointed Muslim spokesmen who happen to be extremely reactionary imams, think you should behave. I think we should say, hi, you're here, you want to pay taxes, you want to be British, you're one of us and we will treat you exactly the same. You are an equal human being, you are not defined by your group. If I, can, if I can give the, the most, well I think it's the most egregious example within Europe of where I think multiculturalism has gone wrong, let's look at Germany. The German constitution has a requirement, I think a terribly flawed requirement, to respect a person's religion. And I just want to give a couple of quick examples of what that has meant. There was a, a woman uh, called Zainab who was a German woman. Her parents had come from Algeria when she was a child. And she got married to a man who was extremely violently abusive. And there was no question, there was no question about the evidence. He was convicted of beating her and beating her child. And in Germany, you have to be separated for two years before you can be granted a divorce. If you want to get it sooner, and obviously she did, she wanted this disgusting man out of her life, you have to go to court. So she went to court. She presented the evidence, no one disputed the evidence, his lawyers didn't dispute the evidence that he'd been violent. 
the judge, who was a female German judge, came back and said, well, I've looked at this case, and there's no question this man is abusive. But equally, the Constitution requires that I look at your religion. And I've been reading the Quran and the, the Hadith. And she read out the passage from the, the Hadith, which actually recommends domestic violence if your wife gets too uppity. And the judge effectively said, well, that's your culture. So for that reason, I'm declining your request. Have a good marriage. This is not an exception. This is not rare in Germany at the moment. There have been a number of so-called honor killings in which women have expressed the freedom that I have taken for granted all my life to choose my own partner, to behave in any way I want to sexually, and uh, the, her, in which the woman's relatives conspired in a premeditated way to murder her. And the verdicts were reduced to manslaughter, and the judge in one case said, I'm doing this because I understand that this woman violated your Anatolian moral precepts. Another example, this is a much smaller example, but I think it's very revealing. There was a 14-year-old girl who wanted to go on a school trip. She happened to be, well, she wasn't, she didn't self-identify as Muslim. Her family were Muslim. And the school trip was further away than a camel could travel in a day, which is as far as the Quran says you can go from your father. Uh, but the girl wanted to go. And her parents wouldn't let her. So the school, entirely to their credit, I don't think a British school would do this, went to court for the right for this girl to go where she wanted. And the judge said, and these were his words, under law, we recognize that a retarded person has to be accompanied by a minor. I see no reason why this should not apply to Muslim women. Now, there is no doubt that judge thought he was being terribly tolerant. And yet it led him to a situation where he was comparing Muslim women to the mentally disabled. The problem with multiculturalism is it puts nice liberal people into alliance with the most profoundly reactionary parts of immigrant communities against the very people we should be siding with. Women who want to live their lives their way, gay people who want to live their lives their way. And the, the problem with this is as well, it gets tied up with the language of respect. When I criticize Islam, as I criticize Christianity and Judaism and Buddhism, I was even once called fat by the Dalai Lama, the, um, the, I get told, no, you have to respect my beliefs. I respect you as a human being too much to respect your ludicrous superstitions. I... I, I do not respect a book that says I should be killed for being gay. I do not respect a book that says Mariam should be killed for being a so-called apostate. Indeed, I abhor that book as I abhor the Bible and the Torah. And it is essential that we retain our freedom to be able to say that. We are finally in this country getting rid of our blasphemy law about Christianity. But at the same time, a de facto blasphemy law about Islam is being introduced, enforced not by the state, but by jihadis. Not very far from here, a brave man tried to publish a book, uh, The Jewel of Medina. It's not a very good book, but it's, an it's a valuable book. I've re I only read extracts from it. And it begins the process that Mark Twain and George Eliot and Bertrand Russell and Spinoza and various people did about Christianity and Judaism. It asks basic questions. Christianity and Judaism have lost their power to terrorize people about masturbation or homosexuality or other perfectly natural things, largely because they've been ridiculed. They've been reinterpreted and they've been ridiculed. It is being made impossible for Muslims to do that. This book, The Jewel of Medina, asks a question that I think would inject doubt into most Muslims' minds. It is a fact, insofar as we can establish any historical facts about the man known to us as Muhammad, that at the age of 53, he married a six-year-old girl, and three years later he had sex with her. We don't know if that was common in Arabia at that time. There's some speculation about it. It may not have been. We do know that nine-year-old girls, whatever their culture, wherever they are, do not like being penetrated by 53-year-old men. Now, actually, the jewel of Medina implies that she enjoyed it. Now, in any other context, that would be shocking. But the very fact that uh, the, the, the book discusses that means that the publisher, not far from here, was, was firebombed. Now, it is essential for Muslims that we're able to question that because it will actually retain their religion at the most infantilized and backward and terrorizing stage if they can't ask these questions. Imagine what Christianity would look like today if Mark Twain had been pulped and the life of Brian was impossible to watch and you know, George Eliot had been banned. It would be a prof this would be a horrible place to live for people like me and a lot of people. Just, just one other very quick point. Another way of delegitimizing criticisms of Islam is to say that these are Western ideas. So I mentioned Bangladesh earlier. I was in Bangladesh earlier this year. 
uh, in a children's home, I met a 15 year old girl. She loved to sing, it was the thing she most loved. And when she turned 11, she was told she couldn't sing anymore because she was a girl and it was disgusting for Muslim girls to sing. And she said to me, you know, that just seemed to me really stupid because I, this God thing just didn't seem right to me. And I thought if, even if there was a God, why would he let boys sing and not girls? Now she thought of that in a village in Bangladesh all on her own. It had nothing to do with anyone in the West. I've met gay people in Gaza and women in Baghdad who had exactly the same thoughts. It is a natural thing that if you present a preposterous superstitious uh, piece of nonsense, naturally there'll be a significant number of people who will go, what? That's not right. And the only way you stop them is to terrorize them. That's not Western. That's not, that's not about Western values versus anti-Western values. We're talking about culture. Whose culture are we talking about? The culture of Zainab who wanted a divorce in Germany or the culture of the man who wanted to beat the shit out of her? Now, we have to make a choice about that culture. It's like saying the culture of the Deep South was slavery. Well, there were some people called slaves who didn't think that was their culture. And a lot of people sided with them and they prevailed. Now, the UAE is planning to send a mission to Mars. Now, I'm concerned because I know that in the UAE, the fatwa churning department already issued a fatwa saying that it was haram to go to the moon. It's forbidden. What is forbidden. UAE going to do? It is, so it is forbidden because if you go to Mars, there would be a threat to life. So mm. you, you were committing suicide and you won't be able to come back. And they don't like it because they like Allah to kill people for them. <laughs> they don't want Mars killing people. You know, it's not right. You well, they said it's okay. Yourself. No, they say it's okay. First of all, it's unmanned mission to Mars. Phew, I was getting and, really worried there. <laughs> and not only that, it's not going to touch down. Oh. Problem solved. It's got, it's got, got fatwa that. saved. <laughs> it's not going to touch down. Therefore, no fatwa is being violated. Nobody's going to be... Uh, there won't be any risk to life. What a relief. What a relief. I was so concerned that the fatwa is going to be broken. It's good to know that they are concerned about this. The fatwa churning, stupid fatwa churning <laughs> machine from United Arab, Arab Emirates. Emirates. Now imagine an all-female orchestra. Okay, it's not a very big deal, but imagine it in Afghanistan, a country where under the Taliban, listening and playing music was completely banned, especially for women. And here are women who are, after 30 years, they're the first people after 30 years in their family that are learning and playing music. It's really a sight to see. Just a moment of life without the Islamist and Taliban. I think that sort of encapsulates not only the reality of life in Afghanistan, what people want, but the future, that a life without the Islamist and Taliban and the reactionary forces where people can flourish naturally. It's beautiful. And also, I mean, the reality of how important music is to human expression, how it breaks all sorts of barriers. We've been talking about that earlier in the program as well. We really want you to see this wonderful clip but before we go, we need to say goodbye. So have a lovely week and we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, goodbye. Enjoy the music. Goodbye. A good girl is the one who accepts her father's word. A good girl is the one who never go to school. A good girl is the one who washes the dishes and sits at home. And unfortunately, I'm a bad girl because I go and study. I want my human right and I want to do what I love.
Hi, I'm Aaron Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.